We're continuing our study in 1 John, but we're going to actually begin in Psalm 15. So take your Bible, turn around to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. We're going to talk about the how and the why today. How we are righteous and where that comes from. But it really helps us to look at Psalm 15 to get an understanding of how we are to live in a righteous way. The context as we get to Psalm 15 here in a moment, in chapter 2 of 1 John, we're dealing with practicing love and righteousness within the fellowship of other believers. The end of chapter 2, as we'll look at today and moving on into chapters 3 and then eventually 4, we're to practice love for the brothers and sisters in Christ and to walk in righteousness as a sign that you and I, we are sons and daughters of God. This passage today is extremely applicable. It's also extremely encouraging and uplifting. So I hope that you're blessed by this passage today that we're going to look at. But let's start by reading Psalm 15 this morning. Psalm 15, and as we look at that, we have that up on the slide here. There we go. Let's do it together. Let's say it out loud together. Read off the screen, please. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. And let's bow for prayer together. Father, I pray that you'll remove all the distractions and all the thoughts of what will go on after this service today. Help us to focus in on these next 30 minutes or so to study your word and to hear from you. And Lord, I pray you'll help us to have open hearts, open minds to receive what you've given us. We thank you that your word does not return void, that it does its work in our lives. And we just pray that you'll help us to receive it, help us to be challenged, encouraged, convicted, whatever it is. Lord, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I encourage you to take out your outline, and the first thing you'll see as we go quickly through this psalm leading into 1 John 2.28 is walk in confident righteousness, righteousness. I think a lot of times I talk about righteousness, we talk about righteousness, so I thought we'd pause and say, how do we know how to live in a righteous way? Righteousness is simply right living, and this psalm lays it out pretty pretty good for us. It doesn't give us everything, but gives us a good handle on it. And so we see, first of all, the children of God walk blameless and righteous before God. In Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 through the first part of verse 2, he says, O Lord, who, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. <clears throat> if you want to walk in relationship with God, to please him, to walk on that holy hill with him, it tells us we have to do what's right. We have to be blameless. Blameless means that we keep our sin list short, that when we realize we sin, we, as soon as possible, confess our sins and ask God to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness to keep that relationship going with God. You know, some people say, well, why do I need to ask God to forgive me of my sin? Because when I came to faith in Christ, he forgave all my sin. He wiped the slate clean, and my sins are forgiven going into eternity. Well, it tells us in Psalm 66 that if we hide iniquity or sin in our heart, God will not listen to us. He won't hear our prayers. And so it's for us to keep that ongoing relationship going with him. We will not be judged for our sins, but we have to keep that relationship by confessing and asking God to forgive us. It shows our humility on our part and our desire to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in order to please him and to serve him. That's what a blameless man means. 
We cannot walk in perfection in this life. Only Jesus did that. As good of an apostle the apostle Paul was, he couldn't do it. And he acknowledged that in many places in Romans 6. He says, I do what I do not want to do. And so we have to come and ask God to forgive us of our sins and to move on so we can walk in a blameless way. But he says also there in Psalm 15 that we're to walk in confident righteousness, that we've confessed our sins, and that we are obeying his commands and we're following the promptings of his word and his Holy Spirit. That is what it means to walk in righteousness with him. Blameless, sins forgiven, power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us as we obey his commands and listen to his word. You see, the children of God walk in the truth, it says in verse 2, at the second part. Speaks truth in his heart. That means that you and I, we filter out the voices we hear, including our own, and listen to the voice of truth, God's still small voice. There are so many voices that are coming at us in this culture. All you got to do is pull your phone out. There's many voices that you're reading about on your phone and media choices that we make. And we have to filter them out and listen for God. And it's interesting that he always goes back to the heart. If we will speak truth to our heart, then truth comes out of us. And then after we listen to that still small voice by faith, and no matter how counterculture it is, we go against our selfish desires and we obey and do as God tells us. A verse of scripture that convicts me constantly is James 4.17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I can't claim ignorance. I know some of the things in God's word. I know things that I'm supposed to do, but I do not do. And so we have to take responsibility and speak truth to our heart and follow that truth. He goes on in Psalm 15 The children of God walk in a righteous way in their relationships. Not only with our relationship with God, but our human relationships. It says in verse 3, Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Interesting phrases there. Doesn't slander his neighbor or do evil. A neighbor, according to Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan, is anyone that we encounter, anyone that we come across. We're not to slander our neighbor neighbor or do evil. He or she does not try to destroy or harm a fellow human being. Stay away from keeping close company with wicked people. Yes, we have to work with people who are not believers, but our closest friends, our closest advisors and counselors ought to be those who know Christ. It goes on to say in Psalm 15 there, honors those who are respecting God and his commands. Those are the kind of people to build deeper relationships with. And here's one that's challenging, willing to keep their word, their promise, even if it costs them to the point of hurting. That your yea be yea and your nay be nay. That you uh, follow and keep your word and your promise to people, even if it costs you something. You see, everyone is made in God's image. And we must treat every person that we encounter with dignity and respect. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory says, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations... These are mortal and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But as immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. All of us, we are immortal. Our souls are going to go somewhere. And God made us in his image. And so we need to treat everyone with dignity and respect. The children of God walk in a righteous way in their business dealings as well. In their business dealings. Psalm 15, verse 5 says, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. It means you don't take advantage of someone by use of money. That you don't take a bribe to bring heartache or pain on an innocent person. 
The righteous man champions the cause for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, for the downtrodden, for the innocent in this life. Monday night, Diane and I went to the theater. We saw The Sounds of Freedom. Who's seen The Sounds of Freedom? Okay? And there's a great example of people who are in need, who are enslaved in sex trafficking and, and, and labor camps as children and all those things. And to see the beauty of, of an, or a group of people doing everything they could to uh, bring those people out of enslavement because they were made in the image of God and deserve dignity and respect. And if you haven't seen that movie with Jim Caviezel, I encourage you to do that. The last thing we see in Psalm 15 here is the children of God walk in confidence because they are part of God's forever family. He says, if you do all these things, go through those, Psalm 15, if you do all these things, he says, he who does these things shall never be moved. That you'll maintain that relationship with your heavenly father, that you'll please him, that you'll glorify him, that you'll serve him, that you'll love him. It gives you confidence, it gives you assurance, it gives you security. So we've looked at the how. These are the things you need to do to live out in a righteous way, right living. But now we're going to transition to 1 John 2.28. So turning your Bible to 1 John 2.28, as we continue this study, we're going to look at the why. What is the, the foundation, the cause of how you live out these righteous things? how to walk in confident righteousness. How are we able to do this? In verse 28, 1 John chapter 2, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Talking about Jesus. Notice that word now. This is an introduction to a new section to this book. This is a paragraph break, and chapter 3 should really, really begin here. Because it moves on in the thought for the next couple verses, all connected. He says, little children, all believers, at every level of spiritual maturity, again, we see the heart of John as the pastor, tenderly reassuring his flock at the church of Ephesus and the churches beyond in Asia Minor of these things. Beloved believers, he says abide. Abide means to persevere, to remain, to stay in the daily commitment to Christ and his gospel. Simply put, to abide equals obedience to God's commands plus love for brothers and sisters in Christ plus continuing to walk faithfully in the truth that was first given to them in the gospel. Abide equals obedience to God's commands plus love for brothers and sisters in Christ continuing to walk faithfully and, and, and following the first truth that was given to them. So when Christ appears here, it talks about, in verse 28, it's a reference, I believe, to the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it talks about how Jesus is going to come in the clouds before the great tribulation period, seven years long. And he's going to take the New Testament saints that were dead and buried, and he'll take those who are alive at the time, and he will take them up, snatch them up, rapture them up into the clouds, and then to take them into heaven at that point. He doesn't physically come down to earth at that point. But then those who've gone up, the New Testament saints and those who are alive at the time, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember, we will not be judged for our sins, but we'll be judged by our speech, our motives, and our works. In Romans 14, 10, it says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We will all have a little shame at the judgment seat of Christ, but it will be short-lived. None of us can live up to God's perfect standard with the battle of our sinful nature, taking on the new nature that's within us in the form of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes the old nature wins, 
But this is not to be confused, this judgment seat of Christ with the great white throne judgment that comes after the second coming of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see what's going to happen at that judgment seat of Christ. In verse 10, Paul says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest or be shown, for the day will disclose it, the judgment seat of Christ, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. There are going to be crowns that will be given. There's going to be given responsibilities for believers based on uh, their works. These responsibilities will go into the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years, and then on into the new heaven and the new earth. And keep in mind that if we are Christ followers, we have a responsibility to seek and to do our part to become daily more and more like Jesus Christ. God and his sovereign power is committed to make us more like his son. So we live in this tension. We have some responsibility, but God is going to make us and conform us into the image of his son. Here's our responsibility in Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, therefore, my beloved... As you've always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both the will and the work for his good pleasure. We have a responsibility every morning to get up and to acknowledge that we are in a battle, a battle with our flesh, a battle with the dominion and power of Satan around us, and that we have to put on the armor of God, And that we have to go out and seek ways to please him. But then Philippians 1, 6 tells us, and I am sure of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We see God's sovereignty. We see man's responsibility and how it works together. This is an unexplainable tension we live in, but God has given us the resources to live for Christ through his resurrection power in the form of the Holy Spirit, his powerful word through the church, through prayer, and through the faith experiences that we have in our lives. Let's move on to 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. John says, If you know that God is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. John MacArthur said membership in God's family can be recognized by family resemblance, mannerisms, and character qualities. Christ followers like a righteous life live a righteous life because they are born again by a righteous God. If you see the children of parents and you see their mannerisms and you hear their conversation and and the way they look many times, you can tell they're part of a particular family. We are shown to the world that we are part of the body of Christ because we live righteous lives, because we serve a righteous God. Notice in verse 29, two no's in that verse. First no means to perceive an absolute truth. The second no in our ESV, it says you know that you may be sure, means to know by experience, to recognize or come to perceive. If you know that God is righteous, and the author and sustainer of absolute truth, then you recognize those who practice righteousness, right living. The effect points to the cause. It isn't so much what we say we believe, but what we do that reveals the evidence that we're saved, that we're born again, that we're washed in the blood of Christ, that we're regenerated, that we're believers in an unbelieving world. When I was a youth pastor in New Jersey, we used to have a gentleman on our, uh, our missionary uh, that, we, that we supported through prayer and finances. To, he was a missionary to our local high schools. His organization called High School Born Againers. 
And he always wore this badge and he gave it to the kids to wear in the halls to get conversations going. Born once, die twice. You're born physically, but you die two times. You die physical and spiritual death. But if you're born twice, born physically, born spiritually, you're only going to die once. And that's the hope and that's the promise. And that's what we can share with people through our righteous life, that they have that opportunity to only die once. So here's our application. Are you walking with God in confident righteousness? We can walk in confidence. We don't do it arrogantly. We do it humbly. We do it, as it says in Romans 5, 2, on the grace that we stand upon, not of anything we have done. But we can stand with confidence that we can live in the way that God wants us to. So reflect on 1 John 2, 28 through 29 and Psalm 15 to understand the why and the how to live a righteous life that pleases God. Now let's look at chapter 3 of 1 John. Our second point is this, walk in the confident and ever-abiding love of God. Walk in the confident and ever-abiding love of God. There's a ton of verses there for you to go home and look up and read, and there's many more that I could have put. But 1 John 3, 1 tells us what we are. We just sang, who you say I am, just a few moments ago. What we are. See what kind of love it says in verse 1 of chapter 3. The Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why this, the world does not know us is that it did not know him. See what kind of love God has given to us. King James, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us. If you want to accurately translate that first part of that verse, it should say, behold, what peculiar, out of this world kind of love the Heavenly Father has bestowed or given to us. Notice the Apostle John's amazement. This is both a command and an exclamatory comment. He's saying, pay close attention to what's coming next. We have in our uh, Bible here in the ESV, see what kind of love. But another version, uh, a version of the Bible says, how great, how great is God's love is used seven times in the New Testament. And it's interesting, there is no English equivalent to the Greek word. It's beyond description. We don't have a good term in our language to put it in. This is God's agape love that's only given to those who are children of God. This agape love was given to us by God's own free will and uninfluenced by our worth. Think about that. He chose you, not because of what you could do for him or how beautiful you were or how gifted you were. God chose you simply because he loves you just as you are. 1 John 4, 19 says that we love because he first loved us. Think about that. He loved you before you even knew he loved you. He loved you from eternity past. We love because he first loved us. His love is ever abiding, unconditional. It reaches down to the deepest sin and sinner. God is the author of love. We cannot know love apart from knowing God. How great is an exclamation of what a glorious, measureless love we have received. And I hope that encourages you today. No matter where you are in your relationship with God, he loves you. And there's not anything you could do to earn any more of his love, nor is there anything you could do to lose more of that love. He loves you unconditionally. In Romans 5.5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 8.32 is not on the screen, but he says, talks about how God did not spare his own son, but willingly gave himself up for us all. How will he not also graciously give us all things? But then it says here in Romans 8.35, and let's say this together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Proclaim that. Stand on it. Believe it in your life. Don't let Satan take that thought away from you. God loves you unconditionally. John MacArthur says about these verses, such love seeks at great cost to itself, but only to give freely, spontaneously for the benefit of others, even if that person is not worthy of such expression. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has two kinds of love. One is a general for all humanity. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The same rain that falls on the unbelievers falls on the believers is a common love, common grace. But there's also a specific love for his followers. And we live in hope and are anchored in hope because as Romans 5.5 5 said, we as Christ followers have experienced and continue to experience God's personal love in our hearts and our lives. Zephaniah 3.17 is a verse that I meditate on and think about a lot. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Think about that. God looks at you. He sees joy. He sees gladness. He sings over you. He bestows his love upon you. That's how God views you today. John goes on to say in the second half of verse 29 that even though we right now do not appear to the world to be children of God, wait because one day we will be. In John 1.12, he said, but to all who did receive Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. The world doesn't recognize us because they do not have a relationship with God and with Christ. And then see what an amazing future God has planned for us. What an amazing future God has planned for us in verse 2. Verse 1 says who we are. This verse tells us what we shall be. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see Christ just as he is. We do not become divine like Christ when we go to heaven, but we receive a glorified body, a resurrected body like Christ. Our sin nature will be eradicated, taken away. That will all be gone, and that, and that way we'll be like Christ, whether we get there in death or in rapture. But in Romans 8, it says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed, to be shaped, to be molded in our personality to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Positionally, today, as we sit here, if you're a believer in Christ, God sees you as if you are already in heaven in your perfected and glorified state. But presently and practically, we are progressing in our sanctification. And that's just a fancy way of saying that God is moving us day by day, degree by degree, moment by moment, to make us more into the image of Jesus Christ. That we're dropping off more of our sin and taking on more of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have all the Holy Spirit, but giving him more reign and rule in our life, to have more control, to see the light of Christ shine brighter through our lives as we go through our spiritual journey. Between eternity past and God's predestination and eternity future and God's glorification, no one who has ever believed in Christ has lost their salvation. It says here in verse 29, no one and 30, no one is predestined for sonship fails to be called. And no one who is called fails to be justified. And no one who is justified fails to be glorified. This is an unbreakable steel chain of divine covenant faithfulness that God has given to us. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul said, and we all, 
with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is in the Spirit. One degree, one process, one step at a time, we're becoming more and more like Christ to reveal his glory in us. And then lastly, see how holiness grows in us. See how holiness grows in us. Look at verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We talked about who we are in verse 1, what we're going to be. Verse 3 tells us what are we to be doing right now. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Lastly, we have a hope, unlike the world, that will sustain us and help us persevere to the end. Philippians 3, 19 through 20 gives us that contrast. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we need to live each day as if it is our last day. Because guess what? One day you're going to wake up and it will be your last day on planet Earth. And people spend more time in general planning their vacations and other peripheral things than thinking about where they're going to spend eternity. We battle as Christians not to be entangled with the affairs of this world, but to be good soldiers in the battle for Christ. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 2, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We need to keep our focus on him. And because we have this hope, we purify ourselves. We live righteous lives pursuing holiness imperfectly. In 1 Peter 1, 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't go back to the way your life was before you came to Christ. But now, but as he has called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Folks, we're going to walk the streets of gold, no doubt, as it tells us in Revelation. We're going to have the privilege to be with our loved ones, the apostles and others who've gone before us and spend eternity and unbroken fellowship with them. According to John 14, we're going to have our own unique place that we can call our home in heaven. But the real prize of heaven will be to see and forever be with Jesus. The one whose nail-pierced hands we're going to see for all of eternity. And the one who loved us enough to die on that cruel and humiliating cross in shame and despair to redeem us and give us the opportunity to have a relationship with him and our heavenly father and enjoy a place in heaven with endless joy for billions and billions of years. As I told my brothers and sisters in Kenya when I was sharing a verse of scripture with them, we're all going to gather around God's throne according to Revelation 5. And we're all going to stand and in our own voices and sing our praises, we're going to say, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive honor and glory and wisdom and power forever. Until Jesus takes us home, we're to pray, to serve, and be looking for his return. During the 1960 presidential campaign, John F. Kennedy often closed his speeches with the story of Colonel Davenport. Colonel Davenport was the speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives. One day in 1789, the sky of Hartford darkened ominously, and some of the representatives glancing out the windows feared that this was judgment day, that the end was at hand. Quelling a clamor for immediate adjournment, Davenport rose and said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it's not, there's no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish the candles be brought. Rather than fearing what is to come, we're to be faithful till Christ returns. Instead of fearing the dark, we're to be lights as we watch and as we wait. Here's our application. Are we walking in confidence that God loves you just as you are? If you take nothing away from this message, I hope you go home and dwell and think about the depth of love that God has for each one of us in our own unique way. 
Our key thought here is that God wants us to walk consistently and confidently in righteousness and purity as we remain in fellowship with him. We can walk in confidence. We just need to fulfill the terms of Psalm 15. We just need to remember 1 John 1, 9 to confess our sins. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We can walk in confidence and consistency if we remain in fellowship with him. When John Todd, a 19th century clergyman, was six years old, both his parents passed away. And a kind-hearted aunt raised him until he left home to study for the ministry. Later, his aunt became seriously ill and in distress, and she wrote Todd a letter. Would death mean the end of everything, or could she hope for something beyond? Taken from his autobiography, John Todd wrote this letter to his dying aunt. It's now 35 years since I, as a boy of six, was left quite alone in this world. You sent me word you would give me a home and be a kind mother to me. I've never forgotten the day I made the long journey to your house. I can still recall the disappointment when instead of coming for me yourself, you sent your servant Caesar to fetch me instead. Todd went on to say, I remember my tears and anxiety as perched high on your horse and clinging Tight to Caesar, I rode off to my new home. Night fell before we finished the journey, and I became lonely and afraid. Do you think she'll go to bed before we get there, I asked Caesar. Oh, no, he said reassuringly. She'll stay up for you. When we get out of these here woods, you'll see her candle shining in the window. Presently, as we did ride out into the clearing, and there, sure enough, was your candle, I remember, Auntie, that you were waiting at the door, that you put your arms close about me, a tired, bewildered little boy. You had fire burning on the hearth, a hot supper waiting on the stove. And after supper, you took me to my new room, heard me say my prayers, and then you sat beside me until I fell asleep. Someday soon, God's going to send for you to take you to a new home. Don't fear the summons, the strange journey, or the messenger of death. God can be trusted to do as much for you as you were kind enough to do for me so many years ago. At the end of the road, Todd said, you will find love and a welcome awaiting, and you will be safe in God's care. May we hold on to that promise and that truth. Don Wurtzen wrote a chorus, part of a song called Finally Home. It says, but just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory and finding it home. Let's pray. Let's pray. Maybe here today, every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe here today and you've been struggling with your relationship with God. Maybe you've doubted his love. Maybe you haven't been looking at yourself from God's perspective. I just want to pray for you today. I want to encourage you. If you're struggling, if you're saying, God, help me to see from your perspective. Help me to know how deep you love me. Help me to know how much you've invested by sending your son to give me eternal life and then to help me to become all that you want me to be. If God's encouraging you today to to pray and to ask him to help you with that. Just slip your hand up, no one looking around. But maybe you're struggling. Maybe you just need encouragement today. I just want to pray for you, anyone at all, about your love for the Lord. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this amazing passage of Scripture. John takes a a break here and, and changes the subject and moves on from where he's been. We thank you for the great love that you've poured out and manifested upon us. Lord, each of us in this room could stand and testify of how much that love has transformed and changed our lives. Help us to not be weary in well-doing, but in due season know that we're going to reap if we do not faint, that you're on our side, that you're our cheerleader, that if you had a refrigerator, you'd have our, pic- our picture on that refrigerator that you love us so much. Encourage us today with that hope. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.